Dios. Hello, hello. Let's do an audio check real quick. Make sure you guys can hear me running my mouth. Greg, Greg Peterson, you stop that right now. That's some all troll type stuff there. I'm not feeling that. Let's see. Sounds great. Good. Loud and clear. Yeah, you even put a little speaker, a speaker picture in there. Yeah, I'm still not real tech savvy like that, guys. You're not going to get a lot of that from me. Not at all. All right. I see that. I, I slowed down the chat 
a little bit. Apparently, I didn't slow it down enough. Thank you, Jay. My friend Jay. I still got another T-shirt to wear of yours. Let's see. Sorry if my intro music was a little dark, but I don't remember anything being real, real positive about Vlad the Impaler. We're going to talk about him. But we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the 1400s. It is a century where a lot happened. <clears throat> and from 1400 on all the way to the present day, it unfolds very interestingly. And you will see that in this video. It's, uh, you know him as Dracula. But you know the Hollywood version. And remember, anything you get from Hollywood is almost, almost the opposite of the truth. Hollywood and the media are, are, are in tandem. Now, that's the overt material. That's the surface material. But Hollywood productions are basically put out. They're produced and financed by a culture of people who have a very long history of using surface texts to conceal deeper messages. Yeah, they wrote a book called, they wrote a book or a collection of books called the Kabbalah, Zohar, Sefer Yetzra. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Thank you, Kelly. Two trees. There were two trees in Eden. There's no doubt. One of them was a tree of knowledge of good and evil basically revealing that evil was here long before the fall of man. And the other was the tree of knowledge. Where is it located? I don't know. But I know one of them's at Giza. Hey, square pig. Shiva Shampoo, Christine, how y'all doing? All right. So my audio is good. Yes, the Kabbalah was verbal until late antiquity. Synagogue of Santa. Well, that was a very good book. I quote that book in my Chronicon many times, and it's not really Santa. But yes, you're right. It's a very good book. Oh, Swan in Houston? Wow. I got some locals. I got some people local to me. So before we get off into this video, I had a couple things I wanted. I had a couple things right here. Let me look on my desktop real quick. With uh, wow, I got too much in the way. So much, so much to do. So much to do. Okay, when my channel was when my channel was relatively unknown, all I, I was working full time, and all I did was produce YouTube videos. Once or twice a week until I had 250 videos done. I had never done a podcast. Didn't need to. I mean, I, I mean, I, I was just on an agenda to, to get a lot of data out there. I'm not even halfway done, but we have a lot more information to cover. We're going to be moving into areas that are going to blow your mind. It's all. And, I, and I'm eager to do that. But with popularity has come some setbacks. And some of you are more familiar with this than me. I have never been successful. I've always been a hermit. I've always been a recluse. I've, I'm very self-absorbed in my research, in my learning, putting it all together. I love showing and teaching people, but I've never been in the position that I am now. And that position is, is an impediment. So I'm asking for help. No, I'm not asking for your money. I get, I get donations that get me through. This is what I made. A, I compiled a list here because I know that some of you have a lot of downtime and a lot of you have sent me emails offering different types of help. But being being a solo act, I don't have a crew. I don't have all, so many little details are starting to stop me from being able to put out two, three and four high quality videos a week like I used to do. Well, I need to get back on that again. The problem is administrative stuff is really starting to stop me. So my emails are in my videos. You can find them. But I'm really looking 
for a few positions to be filled. And I'm hoping that in the near future, they can be paid positions right now. Right now they can, I can, I can donate materials, books, maybe t-shirts, stuff like, stuff like that, but I'm not in the position to pay for this help. And that's the current, that's basically the curse of all grassroots organizations and, and uh, archaics is, a. Uh, is becoming something and it's no longer like a solo act. So one thing I'm going to need help with is, uh, I need a video archivist. I have copies of all 305, 304 of my videos, but I noticed going through all my thumb drives and on my hard drive, uh, about 40 of my videos are very low quality. I don't know why they recorded that way. So I have a list of videos that I need copies of. I don't have time. If I sit here and try to copy myself, it's going to stop me. Everything I do is stopping me from producing videos. That's one thing. If anybody out there has, I, I know exactly what you need and I can tell you what you need uh, as far as what apps to use. But uh, I need somebody who has the time while they're doing chores at home or while they're watching YouTube videos on another device to sit there and record some of my videos. And like I said, it will come with benefits in the future right now. My hands are tied. So the, no, the other thing I need is a transcriptionist. Uh, with over 300 videos, it's become necessary that uh, we have transcripts of each video. Now, I have transcripts of about 50% of them, and the rest of them were a lot, a lot of those videos are from Facebook posts. Oh, and for those of you who don't know, I rejoined Facebook last night. I'm back on Facebook again, and I showed up in the Archaics uh, uh, group and, and reintroduced myself and uh, I'm going to start posting in Facebook again because that's where, where the high quality content came from. Meaning before I got booted off of Facebook on April 1st, it was my habit to compose a very elaborate video and have all my ducks in a row, cite my sources, get my images together. But it would be released on Facebook first every single time. Then I would post it on YouTube. So it would be in textual format on Facebook. It would be in video format, <coughs> excuse me, on YouTube. I need a transcriptionist. I need somebody because the transcripts I download from YouTube, they're terrible. It's just a bunch of run-ons. I have to go add the punctuation. I have to go separate the thoughts and all. I don't like that. YouTube doesn't edit transcripts. It just It's just word downloads. So I need a transcriptionist, somebody who has the time to do that. I need a timestamp indexer. Some of you have already been doing this. Uh, this would be a group effort. Several people could be involved. But uh, I will put, if you go through videos and put timestamps by subject matter, when I'm talking about different things, you put the timestamps. We need to get organized, and I will post your timestamps as the pinned comment so everybody can go through and see. And so we can index every single video that way. Uh, I also... This, this can be a joint effort here from many people. I need a, uh, a, an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions Compiler. I, need, I don't need somebody to throw a bunch of questions at me. I need somebody to put together a document and that document have whatever the 100 most frequently asked questions someone new to my channel. Because here's, the, here's what's happening. 90% of the people that come to my channel and make a single comment on on any of my videos asking a question, 90% of the time those questions are answered and multiple times in different videos. It's always somebody who hasn't watched a lot of videos. And I get that. I understand you're curious. You're seeing new information for the first time that's going against what you've you've pre you 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 know you priorly believed. I get that. But I'm only one individual and I'm never going to be able to answer all these questions. It's just not going to happen. So let's put together a document that I can post on YouTube and on Facebook, on Telegram, and uh, maybe even do a video, frequently asked questions. This is something every single one of you can do. You can get your questions together. I need somebody who's going to organize that. I don't need you to send the questions to me. I need all those questions to go to somebody who volunteers to be the compiler and just start compiling all these questions because that individual is going to be able to weed out all the multiple, the multiple times the same question is asked. So I need time to produce videos and all these little side projects are, are, are the reason my videos have slowed down. I'm not, I'm not cool with that. I like to produce these videos. I have a, 
I have so much content to put out and I need to get it out. I'm burning to get it out, but I can't sit here and get swamped for four days a week doing admin stuff. And then I only have one or two days a week to actually put, put a, videos together and the you know, a day every week to do chores and get stuff that needs to get done around here that's not acceptable with me so i, I i'm looking for a group a consorted effort so uh let's see that's my list really a video archivist somebody who could who could uh copy videos that that i messed up uh i still have copies but they're not they're not they're very low quality um a transcriptionist for all the videos a timestamp indexer or a whole bunch of you doing that and i need somebody somebody to organize that i'm not don't, i don't need you to send them all to me that's 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 just going to defeat the purpose it's going to bog me down with more stuff to do uh, and a frequently asked questions compiler i need volunteers for these positions to send me emails and then i will post the email publicly of the people that are fulfilling these positions so everybody can contact them and we can get this all done really fast so uh also uh, i have thumb drives with all my videos and once i get the the those last 30 or so videos better copies of those uh, I'm going to want volunteers that I can send no charge to you. I will send you the thumb drives. I will send you the thumb drives and, and uh, I will give you the passwords to go into places like Telegram, Rockfin, BitChute, Reddit, uh, where I have pages, but I don't have anything on them yet where we can just start uploading. We can start putting all these videos out there and uh, you can even, you can even be the admin of, of the, of that archaics group. I have, I have a few. I have a few out there. I just never put a single video or anything on there. All I did was just uh, start the account. So uh, let's see. Okay, that's uh, I got all that. Those are done. Uh, for those of you who want to know, predictions are coming. I'm I'm getting back into the predictions. Two things I'm doing, and this is something I could I could use help on too if somebody wants to do it. If not, I'm going to do it myself, even if it takes three or four days. But my predictions playlist, I have over a hundred predictions that I made 17 and 18 months ago within a week after Trump being removed from office. It's very hard for people to wrap their heads around how many of those predictions have actually come true because of the passage of time and the way situations change, not instantly, but gradually, because many of the things I, I predicted were not in the works. I have predictions on the Supreme Court. I have the predictions on, on U.S. and international politics, on, on geopolitical uh, news, on the actual relationship between the public and mainstream media. Those predictions have all come true. Now, I need somebody to actually go through those predictions and maybe maybe do sound bites. Somebody who has the time. Sound bite each prediction or just write it down in a text. Here, this is predicted on uh, on this video right here. So I can do a video, a summary of all the predictions that came true using date sequence analytics and isometric projections. Now, using historical parallels and those that have not yet come true or likely will not come true. Remember, I have never claimed 100% accuracy, but I'm also not afraid to put myself out there and show you show you guys the things I have found, because in those predictions videos, I show you the method. Anybody can follow it, like Square Peg, who has her own channel doing it now. So she employs only one method, but I think she's learning a second. Uh, I might go ahead and bless her game and teach her four or five more, four, four or five more methods, but uh we live in a fixed medium. We live in a construct. And I tell you guys all the time, the collective is fixed. The events are fixed. We're all going to go through it. But in the personal, we all have great power to decide our coordinates and our frequency during those events. So having said that, predictions are coming on the United Kingdom, Israel, Thailand, Dominican Republic. Uh, again, uh, the UK. Romania, I believe Egypt's also on the list. Oh, there's two other countries. It's going to be a huge, huge video all summarizing all the predictions for all. I've already done Romania, but I'm going to do it again because after the passage of six or seven months, we've had the development of new situations that would that would change the analytics slightly, not on major major events, but it would allow me to see a little bit with, with more clarity. So we have those coming up. 
uh, I'm going to, I'm going to try and fit it all in one video, but it's probably going to be like four hours long, but I'm going to read the rest of the lost scriptures of Giza. That's on the table. I just need help with all these other things. That's, that's why, uh, uh, I'm, I'm saying this. Well, thank you for the donations guys. It means a lot. Um, let's see the Phalorn saga. No more emails, please. I had to start a, a third email and, uh, just for all my admins and mods for different stuff. Because my, my other email has been swamped and I'm going through it. But no more emails concerning the Phalorn saga. You can email me questions and stuff like that. But concerning the Phalorn saga, the fantasy books that I wrote when I was in prison in maximum security, when, when I wanted to put all my beliefs and discoveries into a fiction narrative. And I wrote a very deep story about a fairy apocalypse. And, uh, the book, the only paperback book in that entire series is, is, uh, on Amazon now. And, uh, it's called Chronicle of Dagathar. I know I got a copy somewhere. This is the Chronicle of Dagathar. This is a 10,000 year, year by year chronology of all the historical events and personal events of different major characters. Cause some of the fairies are thousands of years old that leads up to this single event for which I wrote a seven book series. Anyway, that's the Phalorn Saga. I'm going to read those on my other channel. I'll be doing that on my downtime. All right, let's get into this. Also, my very next podcast, I haven't got with him yet to talk to, to hammer out an actual date because I needed to get a lot of irons out, uh, in the fire. But my very next podcast is going to be uh, before or on the 27th with Max Eigen or Egan. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but he's my first. And I have several after that. I'm going back on with Waters Above Crypto on the 28th. On the 29th, Gary Warmerdam and I are going back to 1890. Uh, I like Gary. Uh, Gary's a good guy, man. Gary's level-headed. So you don't meet a lot of people. You don't meet a lot of people where you can almost, in just discoursing with him, you can almost sense the gears turning over in his mind. His responses... His, his, his responses to stimuli are not intellectual stimuli. They're not conditioned. They're not, um, they're not reactive at all. You can actually feel Gary thinking about things. And then, and then his next comment or question will come out. That's why I like Gary. It's, uh, then on the 13th of next month in August, I'm going, I'm going live podcast with Forbidden Knowledge News. Now, those are just the four that I have worked out. Now that, now that I'm starting to get things in motion and go, uh, more podcasts are coming. It's uh, I, ha I have I have several emails from people that have, that have, that that are trying are entertaining the idea of, of a chat or podcast. I haven't responded to some of them, and I apologize for that. But like I said, I'm a one man show right now, and I'm trying to change that. Uh, Thirty thousand subs came far faster than it looked like it was going to come at the beginning of the year. You gotta understand, I spent two and a half years uploading videos and never broke 4,000 subs. I just kind of hovered there for a long time. Uh, in January, February, March, and then all of a sudden in April, uh, I, I pretty much launched. And yes, I can thank Santos Bonacci for that. But uh, I've been on the show with him three times now and Syncretism Society. I believe, uh, I believe I was on three times with Logan too. Yeah. Logan just sent me an email. It's pretty interesting about the number 138. I have to dig that back out. So anyway, yeah, the, uh, the post I, I did today about the giants, that's the subject matter of this video is not giants. I posted that on YouTube because I wanted to show you guys and it's something interesting that one of the subs in, in archaics sent me, uh, actual photos of the pages of this old journal from the archives of the Library of Congress. So for those of you who don't know, Library of Congress has some phenomenal material. So uh, I read out of the Library of Congress archives, I read all of the congressional annals, congressional globes, and congressional records. This is how, well, this is why in Chronicon and in my, in my supplemental Chronicon notes that are only available on Thumb Drive right now, uh, the uh, Super PAC, 
I have a lot of quotes from the founding fathers about who the who the enemy is, what they really believed, uh, what would happen to the United States of America if we ever let those people within our borders. Uh, things I cannot discuss on YouTube, but the founding fathers all knew the history. They knew exactly what the world banks were up to, even in 1760s, 1770s, 1780s, 1790s, and the early 1800s during the, the Napoleonic Wars. In fact, the all the Napoleonic Wars was a banking war. So uh, we're not going to get into that. We got too much good stuff to get into to be talking about. Uh, bastards and banks. So let me go through this real quick. Those are my announcements. I just wanted to get those out. Let me go through these uh real quick. Tavio, I just saw your name. I don't know if you're the same Tavio I remember from Facebook. Hmm. Yes. Uh, you guys have you guys have access. Jahara, hello. Uh, and like I said. Like I said, don't get, don't get me wrong. There is nothing greedy about me. Never has been. Uh, as soon as I am able, these positions will be paid. They will come with compensation. Uh, I'm not talking about full-time employment. You, I would have to have hundreds, hundreds of thousands of subs for that. But but uh, they will come with compensation for, for people's work. There's no doubt. Uh, I, one thing I didn't mention on this list is I do have a concept. I came up with about a 40-second intro that would be fantastic. If you guys saw what I saw in my head, an archaics intro, I wouldn't use it for every video. I would only use it for certain videos on a certain topic. But I need an artist. I need a, like a cartoon artist that can look at close to real. I don't mean Bart Simpson type cartoons. I'm talking about comic book cartoons like graphic novels. Something that uh, is more realistic, but still cartoonish. I need an artist uh, because I have about 20 stills, 20 stills that were drawn in. I already have the music put uh, set aside. The intro of these 20 stills tell a little story. It takes about 40 seconds, but it's profound. I want to do a new intro for Archaics, and I, I'm looking for that, for that cartoon uh, graphic artist type uh, artist. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Let's see. Oh, let me get in here. Hello, Pam Pamela. Somebody's name, Jin. Wow. Did Jin like the Arabic demons? Hey, Hardy Davidson, got your emails. You know, you guys, you already know, guy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna respond to somebody who calls themselves Harley Davidson. You already know. You can't fault me for that. Is Nicaragua on the correct calendar? Okay, listen, guys, we're all on the correct calendar. Every single one of us. It doesn't matter what different nations have as the year date. Uh, it can be demonstrated, and it can be, it can be demonstrated in multiple different ways that we're all experiencing the year fifty nine sixteen right now. Now, many of you new to my channel, you just, you guys haven't done the deep dives. Many of you new to my channel have not had time to go back and watch my first hundred or so videos where I break down the entire history of the world mathematically and show how all these calendars are independent systems by, by which they recorded cyclical events and then showed later how they all fit together into a beautiful construct. I have more of those videos coming. I found ways to simplify those concepts, but still that core data is all in the first hundred videos. Don't, don't deny yourself. I mean, I can tell, I watch, I look at my analytics every few days and it tells me a lot. You know, if I can release a video and in 24 hours, it has 12,000 views, but I have, a video that's 30 months old that is absolutely packed with data that doesn't even have 2,000 views, that's a problem. That's a problem. Uh, <clears throat> hello, Stephen Walsworth, my buddy. Listen, that's a problem. Uh, does it, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I, I don't know. It's very difficult for me to, to deal with that type of mindset of someone who, who would just take information at face value. Okay, you enter my podcasts or you enter my live videos and you're impressed with the information. Okay, you're impressed with the eloquence. I get that. 
you should never accept eloquence, presentation, one's physicality, uh, the basically enunciation. None of these at all should ever be taken as factual. If you're not willing to go look at the core data and, and, and basically form your opinion based off the facts, but you're but you're more readily able to to uh, agree with my findings because of the way I present them, that's a problem. It's not a problem for me. It's a problem for you. So I'm a. I can see in the analytics that people aren't going back and watching those videos. And then I see in the comment section when people do and it blows their mind and they say, holy shit, I had no idea this happened at such such year or holy crap. I had no idea man, that, th that this meant this and all these sources that back it up. And then people buy the books that I'm talking about in those videos, not books I wrote. I'm not making any money. I rarely ever push my published books. I'm always pushing the books of men that died long before I was born. So anyway, having said that, some of you guys new to my channel, some of you guys that are new to my channel, you're, it's not, it's not a duty. It's not homework. You're going to find things that you're going to resonate with. And some things are going to just open up your mind to a whole new paradigm. And you're going to realize, oh, wait a minute. This is now I understand where all these other channels are coming from. Like today, we're going to Vlad the Impaler is what we're going to get to. But it's not what we're going to start with in this video. You know him as Dracula. The century, the 100 year period we're going to talk about in Chronicon. Here's Chronicon right here. Is the 1400s. This history shows us many things, and we have many sources by which to show that these events occurred. The entire archaeological record is on board with these events. None of this is fictional, none of it's made up, none of it's unusual. Well, some of it is kind of unusual, but it's all enmeshed together in beautiful numbers as well. It's a construct. If it happened according to fixed principles or if it's all invented and it's an arithmetic construct that we have put together, doesn't matter. All that matters is we're in the here and now and something is giving us this to study, which basically implies there's something to learn. So by all means, let's get, let's get into this study after I drink this water. Okay, last, last look at my little comments right here before I deep dive. Okay, lower class citizen, how you doing? All right, guys. Before I, before I begin with the year 1400, let's put this in proper perspective because this is the year 2022. So we're talking about 622 years ago. But even more so, we're talking about a world that is just recovering from something that occurred that was so hellish that the history books are very scant about it. And yet we know we know from the records of the time that it was ubiquitous. We know that in 1400, the world was just waking up from the greatest murder spree that had ever happened among the human, hum, human, basically the human race. Nothing like this had ever happened. In the year 1347 A.D., one third, at least one third of the entire world's population was completely decimated in a weird plague that caused blue and purple lesions on people's body. Their lymph nodes swelled, their skin turned purple and their veins began to pop out and it took a long time to die. There was no recovery. If you got it, you died. It's called the bubonic plague by historians. It may have been something far worse. The historian, I have a video about this 
uh, that you guys can go watch. It's in that first hundred video series. The historians of the time do not tell us that rats came from ships from the east. They didn't tell us that at all. That's a modern interpretation by the establishment. What the historians of the day tell us is that cigar-shaped objects appeared in the sky. Some of them sprayed a mist and it caused people to get sick, fall down, and die. Other cigar shapes opened up their bellies and dumped decayed and mutilated animal body parts in the forest. And from the stench, the plague was born. The establishment doesn't talk about these historical records. My video, my video goes to the sources and to, to uh, the authors in the last 20 and 30 years who we also wrote about this episode. It's the Great Black Death. Our story here begins as the world is waking back up. 52 years later, the world is now waking back up. And 53, 54 years later, the world's waking back up, just getting started. And during this period, the Christian world, the European world, is not doing good at all. They have, they have survived the attacks of the Khans, although at great decimation. One of the last, Tamerlane, or Tamer the, Timur the Lame, we know him as, uh, him as Tamerlane. These great genocidal chieftains that just just brought destruction everywhere they went. Those episodes were over and a new enemy entered the Europe, the European theater. It was the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, uh, to be more precise. They became the new the new plague of Europe. This this Muslim invasion followed the invasion Muslim invasions of centuries earlier that finally Charles Martel of France, the Francs, had defeated. Now, what puts this into perspective is if you go through my chronicon, you will see detailed historical records of all the centuries that the, all this was going on. Uh, much of the material of the Tartaria narrative comes from these periods. There was invasions of foreigners, but those foreigners didn't bring engineers and architects. They used local ones. However, they forced the local Gothic and, and uh, uh, the, the, basically the artisans of the day in Europe to, to employ the foreign, uh, basically, art, the aesthetics. This is why the buildings are so fundamentally different than what other European time periods produced. So we have these massive con invasions and all their foreign engineers that they had brought in and the local ones that they had forced to work. And then we they, they dissipate. Then the Muslim invasions. Then following the Muslims invasions, we have the Turkish, the Ottoman Empire, also Islamic. They come in. This is the background to our story. At this time, people used to go to sleep. I mean, before they went before they went to bed at night, they used to pray to God to deliver them from the comets, from the plague, and from the and from the Turks. This was a very common prayer all throughout Europe during this period. People feared three things the comets, because they were they were happening and evil things were occurring on earth when they did. They feared the comets, they feared the plague, and they feared the Turk. So anyway, this isn't me making it up. This comes from the historical record. This is a very common prayer. Now, um, let's see. Starting at 1400, as the world is waking up, in the year 1400, a large piece of metal fell out the sky and landed in Bohemia. Not, that's nothing that I should normally tell you guys about. However, it landed in Bohemia, which is where our story begins. By the time most of it had burned up, when the Bohemians uncovered the metal, the piece of metal that fell from the sky, it was still 235 pounds. Now, <clears throat> 1400 is in the middle of the burning times. 
the burning times were harrowing because the Roman Catholic Church had come up with a plan to disenfranchise many people from their from their from their their wealth and they did it in two ways they sent they sent all all these men to go fight in the crusades against the muslims knowing many of them wouldn't come back when they received news that the men had died on muslim battlefields they trumped up charges of witchcraft against the females that were still ma uh, holding down the manors, the castles, all the, all the lands. And in this way, the, the Roman Catholic Church didn't have to pay the men that had died on the battlefield. They didn't have to pay into their estate. And they turned around because the church had already in, uh, created new laws, new new papal bulls and edicts, declaring that any any household or where the where the owner of the house or the inheritor of the house was to be accused of witchcraft and be found guilty, all their all their rights and possessions was forfeited to the church. The burning times saw an innumerable amount. 99.9% .9 of them were female. There were a few males in there, but these women had done no wrong. About 99% of them weren't even witches. They were landowners. They owned cattle. They owned things the Roman Catholic Church wanted. Some of those women actually survived the torture to be burned at the stake. Most of them were on the verge of death by the time they were burned. Some of them were burned alive. Others, well, others, like I said, were already dying as they were being born. They had been starving, put in dungeons. Uh, the Roman, the Roman Catholics, uh, they had basically, uh, it's murder. It's fucking. It's just hundreds of years of murder is what it was. This was done by Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, and the clergy. So, this is the background to this amazing story that you guys have received from Hollywood as Dracula. I'm telling you now, the story of Vlad the Impaler is far deeper. So, for the year 1400. So in 1401, we have Tamar the Lane. His capital was Samarkand. Again, this is a Hollywood, a Hollywood, a major Hollywood theme. Comes from old, old fiction and old books. So, oh, uh, Samarkand was the ancient land, the old kingdom that Conan the Barbarian was always roaming around. That was Samarkand. Okay. <clears throat> now, the Khans, contrary to popular belief, you got to understand, the hist what you what you read in the history books, a lot of it is such BS. It's such BS. Let me let me cite an ancient author who describes what Tamer the Lane, Tamer Lane, actually looked like. This is a Mongol leader, one of the one of the last of the Khans. The Arabic, the Arabian Muslim writer Ahmed Ibn Arab Shah describes Timur as mighty in strength with a long beard, very tall, white in color, lame on his right side, powerful in voice, brave, and absolutely fearless. This was a con. Now, 1402. Two Two comets appeared over Europe in the year 1402. Jab Jabokus Angelus of Ulm, Germany, or Norway, one of them, somewhere in Europe, he wrote about he wrote about these two comets that appeared. Nothing unusual happened other than, other than that. But you got to understand, we're we're emerging out of the Dark Ages into the into the Middle Ages. Well, we're in the Middle Ages, but the Middle Ages had a setback. The Middle Ages were already in full swing, and then as, as, as this great period of enlightenment was just starting to go out, all of a sudden the Nemesis X object appears in 1314 and begins all kinds of hell. It's a great black darkness that obscured the stars in the year 1314. It was followed by the great black death plague. So... Uh, 
1404, not the entire world is not dark. In 1404, the Chinese put together 5,000 pages of encyclopedia covering 4,000 years of Chinese history, discoveries, the arts, the rulers, the dynasties. The Chinese in 1404 began putting together just the, ma the, magnus, the magnum opus of China. China was going through an enlightenment period. So this is, this is remember, we're, not, we're, we're now a full generation, like 45, 50 years after one third of the entire world's population has died. So this was China. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's a 4,000 volume encyclopedia. It's a library. That's what it is. In, here's where our story begins. It begins in the year 1408. Societus Draconis begins. It is the Order of the Dragon or the Order of the Society of the Dragon. Now, this is a secret of society that actually goes back even farther, but it was resurrected in Romania right here in the year 1408. Well, actually in Hungary. It ended, it ended up going to Romania, but it was it was resurrected in Hungary, not far, by Sigismund von Luxemburg. Now, my, my note here <coughs> from the book, The Dragon Legacy, page 22, says the Order of the Dragon was essentially reborn. It is an ancient fraternity, and it was in the only, the only members are nobility and kings. So, dukes and barons and, and earls and stuff like that. Society's dragon. Interestingly, this is the year 1332 of the Saka calendar. The Saka calendar represents a Indo-Aryan people that had established a timekeeping system in India. It is the year 666 plus 666 Saka reckoning. This is when the Order of the Dragon calendar began, 1408 A.D. In 1409, the Chinese navigator Ching Ho took the largest fleet China had ever put together and sailed around Ceylon into the Indian Ocean. It's several places throughout the, the coastlines of Southeast Asia, the Chinese erected commemorative pillars with Chinese describing this, this a major voyage. In Chinese, Tamil, and Persian, the Chinese imperial policy was to parade the wealth of the empire and exhibit its magnificence rather than dominate over its subjects. Do you see something interesting here? The Chinese spent their wealth and built a fleet of 500-something ships that contained museums that China wanted to show off to all these other Asian nations. To show them, look, floating museums, floating zoos, floating military garrisons to show off the wealth of China. But the Chinese, although they could, didn't invade any of their neighbors. One of the animals was a giraffe. Thought that was pretty interesting. But in 1409, we have another significant development in Asia. We have historical records showing that Gutenberg or Gattenberg, whatever his name was, did not invent the printing press. Coster of Harlem invented the printing press for the Europeans. But even that isn't a true uh, inception. Because we now have records that print blocks were first used in Korea as early as 1409. So in 1415 AD, we have John Huss. We need to discuss John Huss before we get to Vlad. John Huss of Bohemia was a scholar priest from Prague. 
a moral reformer. He was totally against the Roman Catholic Church's practice of keeping the Bible away from the common people. I know a lot of you have a problem understanding that. But it was only in the 1700s that it became popular for common people to even be allowed to open up and read a Bible. Wycliffe started it, but it didn't become popular until the late 1700s, like 1776. Until then, only clergy read Bibles, and the Roman Catholic Church was dead against any Protestant Bibles being read by the common people. So, uh, John Huss of Bohemia was against that. And he did something that the Roman church could not forgive him for. He translated the Bible into his own native language. And the Bohemians loved him ever since. So the papacy, they declared John Huss a heretic, and uh, they condemned him. And many of John Huss's friends and colleagues and family had told him, do not go to Rome, they will kill you. At the time, Rome was, was, was busy burning women and taking all their properties. But they had time to burn John Huss too. And they told him, you need to stay away, you need to stay away. So unfortunately, unfortunately, this is one of, this is one of, the periods of history where we really get to see the inside of the Vatican for what it is. They issued a public declaration to John Huss that he would have protection. He would be, he would have an immunity if he would just come to Rome and discuss this matter. John Huss went, I, he knew he was going to die. I think he knew John Huss went, the people of Bohemia were devastated. They didn't want him to go. They were really devastated when John Huss was arrested, tortured, and burned at the stake. That was unforgivable. And the Roman Catholic Church had no idea just how much they were about to lose behind doing that. This is the story of the Bohemians, the Hussites, is what they later called themselves. And the Vatican, it began in 1415 AD. Vlad the Impaler was already alive, and we'll get to him. Make sure my, I'm, I'm looking at the chat thread real quick, make sure my audio's still good. I'd hate to think I was uh doing something dumb. Just anybody, tell me I'm good on chat. Okay, mister, thank you. Loud and clear, lower class, good. Okay. So, pull that out, get this up. So, anybody can verify this history. I'm not making it. This is all in Chronicon. For those of you who don't have access to Chronicon, it's in Gumroad links below. This is, this is Chronicon. I told you guys I can literally do hundreds of videos out of Chronicon, not, not even counting all, all my unpublished notes. Chronicon is packed. We can do a mathematical analysis of all, all of this on a, in another video. Right now, I just want to get the details out. The Bohemians were pissed. So there was a full-scale in, insurrection. No more money was going to, to Rome from, from uh, Bohemia. The Vatican put a papal army together invaded Bohemia and got their asses kicked bad. So bad that other European nations were indignant about how badly that the papal army had been defeated. A multinational confederation of armies all came together under papal flags and Vatican sent more mercenaries this massive invasion invaded Bohemia, Bohemia, and the Hussites still, still enraged that their holy, their holy man that brought their nation the Bible had been lied to and, and had been, uh, thank you, Roland, had been, had been lied to and, and burned at the stake. 
they felt the entire nation had been disrespected. They took their wagons and they took their farm wagons and they turned them into war wagons. They took their tools. They were not a military nation. They took their tools, farming tools, hunting weapons, and they built, put, they forged themselves into an army in Bohemia. In a series of battles, this small group of Hussites, the Bohemians, led by, they were basically, they were basically filled with a righteous indignation and a belief that God was on their side. And they beat the shit out of every single army that invaded Bohemia even the Confederation, all the mercenaries of Rome, and sent them running. This is in the historical record. This is, this is one of the amazing feats of, of, of early Europe, 1400s. So, called the Hussites. Now, I, this was the second time Rome has a problem with ego. The Pope wasn't going to take an ass whooping. He did not care how many other Europeans died because he and the Cardinals were not fighting. So he sent a third collection of armies that was even bigger, summed up. Now he's emptying Vatican coffers to pay for armies. Some kings and queens told him, no, no, we're not, we're not sending our army to Bohemia. We're not doing that. Finally, after about a year, he amassed such a huge, huge, massive invasion force. But the Bohemians had already had two major victories. And they were still smarting over the fact that their hero had been dealt so treacherously with. The third invasion? Again, the Hussites prevailed. The Bohemians were now feared all across Europe. No one wanted to mess with the Bohemians. So we have the situation unfolding over a period of years. Rome waited two or three years, amassed another major invasion force, and again invaded a fourth time, then did it again a fifth time. And guess what? Rome never again invaded the Hussites. The deal. The Bohemians won all five wars. That's all. It's, all. it's awesome. It's awesome. But what does it tell us today? Well, it should answer for several of you who have asked me in emails and in the comments sections. You have asked this. Many of you asked the same question. Uh, about the elite ha always having control. Have the elite always been in control? Or what's the, well, what's the, what, I mean, what's the point of any type of resistance if the elite have always been in control? Well, you're asking me a question based off a false premise. I have never seen evidence in Chronicon, in my historical studies, excuse me, that the elite have always been in control. I've seen just the opposite. I have seen major forces contending with each other. In this, in this instance, it was the Hussites full of spiritual Christian rage against a spiritual oppressor, the Vatican. And they won all five times. But that doesn't put the Hussites on one side and the Vatican on the other. The Vatican is but an arm of what we call today the deep state. But the deep state is a consortium of families. It's a consortium of, 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 of basically the elite. There is an opposition. My problem is I'm not going to sit here in this studio and try to convince you guys that there is a whole other collection of human families that are opposed to them. And this is why we get these weird things happening in history. Uh, all throughout history, these major things are developing. They're going to go a certain way. All of a sudden, some breaks them. No. My view and my historical vantage point is very different. There is opposition. I do not believe it is human, but I do believe that it requires human agency to manifest. That's a big difference. So, the Vatican met with opposition quick, too. All right. <clears throat> Here's something interesting in 1417. 
Let's see. I don't want to leave anybody behind. All right. Now, 1417. France and Spain, followed by other European nations, held a council. It was called the Council of Pisa. Y'all know the, the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa? That's what it's talking about. In this council, several European nations came together to affirm that Christianity was a very high antiquity in Britain. They also determined in this year of 1417 uh, that Christianity, not only was Christianity ancient, but it, but it was first found in Britain, but also that ancient Britain was the first nation to adopt the gospel. That's very interesting. Now, for those of you who have read my Chronicon, you will understand that much of the Old Testament history did unfold very, very interesting, the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and many of the developments of Paul's life after he left the Middle East are found only in the British Isles. So why Paul felt it necessary after his after after he basically laid down the cornerstones of the Christian faith ha having adopted much of the gnostic tenets he left the Middle East. He left the Mediterranean and he appeared in the historical record in ancient Britain. But he didn't just choose Britain uh for any reason, it's who was already in Britain and what his message was about. Now, all this is in Chronicon, but it's not the subject matter of this video. We might get into it in another one. But it has everything to do with the Stone of Scone. So some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, the Stone of Destiny. All right. <clears throat> in the year 1419, the Chinese finally complete the 4,000 volume encyclopedia of Chinese history. Man, I would love to read that. I don't even know if I could read that in my entire lifetime. 4,000 volumes of Chinese history? Oh my God. I would love to read that. Man, it's terrible. In the year 1420, there goes the papacy. The papacy's declaring war against Bohemia again. And at the exact same time, 1420, in both Lyons, uh, it, uh, in Lyons, France, and from Austria, the Jews are run out of both countries for financial malpractices. They run them completely out of both of those countries. Now, the church made a major push in 1420. They had declared by edict that, uh, well, let me read it right here. I don't, I don't want to misquote this. Rome sought to end the idea of individual peoples possessing copies of the Bible in their own languages. Rome only approved Latin translations of the scriptures and only to be read by priests on certain days of the year and only certain passages were to be read. That sounds like censorship to me. You're only going to read me two or three verses each time we get together three times a year? And I'll never be able to know if those verses really say that. And I won't get to see the other 99.999999% of the Bible. Sounds like, that, sounds like, that sounds like the Pope to me. All right. The, the papacy was so pissed that they even filed a former edict declaring that John, John Hess was guilty. They're trying to clean. They're trying, they're, they're trying to justify murdering the man lying to him, giving him safe passage, revoking it, torturing him, and burning him at the stake. So, yeah, it's crazy. The hero of the Hussites was John Ziska. John Ziska was a veteran. He had one eye. And uh, the people loved him. He was an ex-knight. And uh, he's the one that got all the people to take their wagon and fruit and vegetable carts and to put them and turn them into war wagons. So, now... 
We say war wagons because that's what the historical record is talking about. But the descriptions these war wagons have, we're talking about the Bohemians being the very first in modern history to invent tank warfare. Because that's what they did. They probably rolled those wagons heavily armored with weapons hanging out all over them straight into the crowds of the oncoming invaders. Excuse me, invaders. Now, General Ziska called his men the warriors of God. He defeated, he defeated Emperor Sigismund and the Pope several times. Really good book put out. It's a really good book that describes his whole history in detail because I'm not going in detail in this video just on John Huss. We're going to get to Vlad. The book is called Huss the Heretic. It might be a 110, 120 year old book, but it's called Huss the Heretic and uh, it's it's uh, put out by Book Tree. If anybody wants that book, it's probably like $12, $13. Really, really good history. I love those old books. So, but the reprint, you can get in paperback pretty cheap uh, from Book Tree. That's a 1-800-700-TREE. You, you can call Paul Tyson and get that book. All right. So, in 1421, Emperor Sigismund retreated with a much depleted army. But two more papal armies invaded Bohemia, totaling 100,000 men. General Ziska led the Bohemians in a stunning series of victories, sending both armies fleeing out of Bohemia. That is just crazy. crazy. And this year, 1421, was also the 52nd year of the Ming Dynasty that overthrew the Mongols. In this year, the Forbidden City in China was finished. On February 2nd, the Chinese New Year. Thank you, Harley. For those of you who don't know, although I know my Aussie listeners know this, but for those of you who you don't know, the Chinese those gigantic fleets that used to go show off their zoos and, and their floating museums and their garrisons to all these other uh, Asian nations, one of those massive gigantic fleets somehow ended up in Australia. Yeah, that's in the historical record. And that would have been about 23 centuries after the Egyptian fleet that was lost wound up in Australia. How are these massive giant fleets just all of a sudden disappearing from the continents, the continental seas over here and reappearing in Australia? How's that, how's that happening? In 1424, in 1424, the Jews are expelled from Cologne, and General, and General John Ziska of the Bohemian Army, he dies from the plague. He instructs his men to take his skin and make a war drum. After he died, they made a war drum, and the warriors of God, the Bohemians, never lost a battle after that because every time they entered into a conflict, they beat on the war drum of John, of John Ziska. Pretty gruesome back then, but we haven't even got to gruesome yet. That's what this video is about. Uh, even, even before we get to Vlad the Impaler, you're going to read some gruesome, you're going to hear some gruesome stuff. That was John Ziska and the Hussites. So we're moving forward in time now, man. A fourth crusade against the Hussites of Bohemia was assembled from all the papal countries of Europe. There was 100% participation across Europe as all, fear, by this time, feared the Pope. The invasion was initiated behind the news of John Ziska's death. This massive army invaded Bohemia, and to the amazement of all of Europe, it was crushed by the Bohemians who fought furiously to the beat of Ziska's war drum, which, according to reports, issued an incredibly deafening noise. 
The Papal army fled into Germany, and parts of Germany then fell to Bohemia. Yeah, you guys got to read that book, Hus the Heretic. Hus the Heretic. It's fantastic. It really is. All right, guys. We're moving into 1428. One of my favorite, one of my favorite personalities from history in 1488. Some of you know him. Henry the Navigator. Henry the Navigator of Portugal, he brought back from Venice, Italy, a map of the world that showed South America and the continents of the world. This is in 1428. Now, Portugal actually means Port of the Gauls, for those of you who don't know. All right. Now, there's a lot of speculation that the Venice map According to, to, now this is an expert, Gavin Menzies. According to Gavin Menzies, the Venice map that shows the distribution of the continents and, and uh, South America was a map made by the Chinese that had come into Portuguese hands. That's pretty interesting. And for those of you who don't know, Henry the Navigator was Knights Templar behind the scenes. Knights Templar officially were gone. They were officially gone, but unofficially, they were now ba basically highly opposed to all the papal, all the, uh, all the, basically the, I keep seeing that flash, but somebody else told me what it might be having, having another app open at the same time that I'm running a video. So I'm going to close this word file. That was just my announcements, different things I need help with. Maybe it'll stop. I don't know. I don't know. Thank you guys for the donations. You know I'm going to put them. Hey, Wendy Flores. Look at that little blue wrench. I bet you didn't know, Wendy. Back a year and a half ago, when you were asking me every question in the world, man, that you'd actually be a moderator one day. Isn't that something? All right. Now. I know some of you women know that we're getting real close to a date that you guys, you females, know, know pretty well. So, again, the Roman papal armies, the Hussites, they defeated, they, 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 get, they get their asses kicked by the Hussites again. All together, let's read, I, I, don't, I want to quote this. I want to quote this. I don't, I don't want, I don't want to misquote this. The papacy in Rome unsuccessfully launched multinational armies nine times against Bohemia. Simply because they asserted their divine right to read the Holy Scriptures in their own language. A seed planted by the, for, by the reformer John Huss. You didn't invade those people to take their stuff. You didn't invade those people because they were doing something they weren't supposed to be doing. The Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, the Roman Catholic Church. Something very powerful even today. The papacy, the Vatican, they did that. They did that. And they were doing that at the same time that papal agents were raping women all over Europe and then shutting them up by putting them in these dungeons that the his historians have has ba 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 they basically turn it into a euphemism. They call them nunneries. No. So. At the same time in history, 1431, on May 30th, on May 30th, these sorry bastards burned Joan of Arc at the stake alive. Y'all know the story of Joan of Arc. Same time. Here we, got, here we got two major historical personalities here. Really four. John Ziska, for the time, was super. He was super uh, 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 popular. John Huss. Super popular man. I mean, he started a whole movement, and then Joan of Arc. We've all know we all know the story of Joan of Arc. She was the hero, but then but then when she was no longer needed, they burned her at the stake. It's no good. 
Yeah, the Roman church and Britain feared her influence and despised her role in the liberation of France because she was a female. That she eventually married uh, Sieur, Sieur de Armand of Metz, even having a family together, has long been a theory that they burned somebody else and it wasn't Joan of Arc. Kind of hard, though, with so many people knowing what she looked like while she was on that pyre. It's kind of hard, kind of hard to believe that one. Whatever. Now, I've told you guys many times, I have shown you, I have demonstrated in my videos that when f people that are very famous in the historical record die, someone very famous in the historical record is also born. We have the same thing happening now. We have Joan of Arc. John, well, John Ziska died a couple years earlier, but Joan of Arc died in 1431. But in 1431, Vlad the Impaler was born. So now we're gonna get we're gonna get into Vlad. Now you need to go go listen to my Nostradamus videos, and I show you how that happens. Mother Shipton dies. Francis Bacon, his mother Shipton, Francis Bacon, Nostradamus, Trimethius, how all these lives and births, it's just fantastic. Yeah, there's definitely a rhythm into the ways of the holosphere. This is not random at all. So, Joan of Arc dies, Vlad the Impaler is born. In 1433, two years later, a comet is seen over Europe and recorded by Piero Toscanelli who recorded its exact positions as it passed and traversed across the sky. In the year 1440, Coster of Harlem invented the European printing press. Yep, wasn't Gutenberg. There is a statue of the Dutchman in the city of Harlem at the marketplace commemorating his invention of him holding up a letter block with the inscription 1440 A.D., which reads, The inventor of the art of printing with movable letters of cast metal. Coster's apprentice stole the concept and invention itself, itself and fled to the city of Mainz, Germany, where it was demonstrated for Gutenberg. Gutenberg bought it and has ever since been, been known to historians as the inventor of the print, printing press. Sound like Facebook? Sound like Google? Does it sound like Google Earth? Do y'all know the story of Google Earth and, and where that really came from? Yep, happens a lot. Sound like Edison and Tesla? Reichenbach? Man, I can go on. There's a bunch of them. Yeah, man. I'm telling you now, Gutenberg has been, he, he wasn't no Lee Iacocca. Oh, this is ridiculous, man. History, I get, I get, I get to a fault. I'm so, I'm so empathic with what I read. I feel as I'm reading the indignant, the being, be, I'm just, I can feel when somebody is so angry in history be, by, by the way they were treated or whatever. I just feel it, man. I, I'm there. My imagination must be off the chart because when I'm reading history, I'm living through it. I'm going through it. So that's what happened, man. He got screwed over bad. Printing press changed the entire world. But let me tell you what it also what, what also happened in the same year of 1440, which is 144 times 10. 10, the number of completion. 144, epic number in the golden proportion, represented in the Fibonacci series. In the year 1440, Italian Renaissance scholar Lorenzo Valla, the papacy hates this dude, he proved that the Roman Catholic text titled The Donation of Constantine was a forgery, a text that the papacy claimed was written by Charlemagne on his deathbed, bequeathing all the monarchies of Europe to be controlled by the Pope. That's amazing. Now, I don't have it right here, but I remember the story. So let me tell you. Shortly after Constantine's death, uh, uh, it is claimed that a document surfaced and then disappeared called the Donation of Constantine. Then it resurfaced and it was studied. 
And it said it was signed by Charlemagne. So the donation of Constantine was basically donating all of Europe, Europe to the, the Pope. Stupid, absolutely stupid. But the text was written and it was believed for like 500 years. Yeah. Until Lorenzo Valla came around and he showed that the text can't be old because all the Bible verses are quoting the Latin Vulgate. And the Latin Vulgate didn't exist when Constantine was dead or alive. So he totally busted him. But it doesn't matter. All the damage is done. 500 years had already, had already gone by. So it don't even matter. In 1441, Cambridge College was begun by King Henry VI of England. In 1444, the Jews are rounded up and they are expelled from the Netherlands. At this time, Jewish merchants run a monopoly in human trafficking throughout the Mediterranean. Bunch of, listen, a lot of... A lot of people really need to pay attention to this type of history. I'm not going to do it on this channel. I'm just giving you small tidbits of what I've got in my Chronicon. But I'm telling you, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of these people get triggered when they come to my channel and they think I'm, I'm the racist. They think I'm this and that. You don't even, you don't have a clue about your own history. I promise you. At this time, Jewish merchants run a monopoly in human trafficking throughout the Mediterranean. Portugal received its first shipment of human cargo, 200 African slaves that were sold on the market. Prince Henry, an intellectual, uh, intellectual uh, explorer who researched old maps and built Portugal's international trading empire, began to send out expeditions to distant shores to find new trade routes around Africa to the east. Portugal, or Port of the Gauls, was diverse in racial stock of Celts, Iberians, Englishmen, who in Henry's time intermarried with Greeks, Italians, Germans, Asians, and the populations throughout predominantly Christian uh, uh, nations. Also, Muslim and Jewish. Essentially, Portugal was a forerunner to the United States. That was by the Jewish author, Daniel Borston. His book is called The Discoverers. All right. In 1447, 1447 is a really interesting year. In 1447, we have the oldest preserved manuscript printed by Gutenberg with his press, and it was on astronomy. 1447 BC, that's AD, 1447 BC uh, is the date of the exodus of Israel from Egypt. 1448. Let's see. Let's see here. Okay. Now, in 1448, the Vatican, remember, I'm reading events now that were happening as Vlad, Vladimir, was growing up. He has not become Dracula yet. The Vatican Apostolic Library was founded by Pope, Pope Nicholas V when he brought together earlier papal collections of books in Greek Arabic, Latin, Hebrew, with his own extensive library. The library was begun with 80,000 handwritten texts and quickly grew to over a million books. This is the origin of the Vatican Library. 1448 A.D. They start bringing all the books of the known world together to Rome in 1448 right after Gutenberg starts printing books. Fourteen fifty, this is two years later. Pope Benedict the thirteenth declared, this is a direct quote. The heresies, the vanities, and errors of the Talmud prevent the Jews from knowing the truth. 
Now, sometime prior to him, Pope Gregory the Ninth had wrote that the Talmud contained every kind of vileness and blasphemy against Christian doctrine. My friends, there's a reason why I am I am I chose the 1400s. Many of you have asked me about the elite. Many of you have asked me, man, if, they, if, if they're all in control. Uh, are, uh, is there any opposition? Is there any way to oppose them? I'm telling you now, they are not unified. Look what was happening in the 1400s. Today, the Vatican is Jewish controlled. Back then, it wasn't. Back then, the Vatican, although the Vatican was evil, they were strictly opposed to Judaism. Not just as a religion, but also the race. Oh, there is a lot of venomous pap papal edicts, papal bulls about those people. I'm not going to read them, though. You can. Now, in 1453, this right here was formative for Vlad, who became the impaler. In 1453, the rising Muslim empire of the Turks captured Constantinople. Constantinople was the great Greek East, Eastern, Eastern Orthodox Christian city, the center of Christian empire. It was Byzantium. Anciently, it was called Byzantium. When, it, when, it, when Christians had basically overrun Byzantium, they changed the name from Byzantium to Constantinople. From Constantines. On May 29th, the Turks seized power and captured the city. A massive blow to Europe. The decisive weapon that altered the history of warfare Warfare was turned down by the Europeans who refused to invest in the gigantic cannon that a merchant had offered them. But the Turks instead bought the cannon. Wow, that's crazy. The fall of Constantinople in 1453 was preceded by strange omens and unusual red lights floating over St. Sophia's Cathedral that even alarmed the Turks outside the city and, to, and had delayed the battle. These were followed by a thick fog. There was said to be an eclipse of the sun, a terrible thunderstorm, and then torrential rain. All of this stop the Turks from taking the city. Initially, Constantinople is a reflection of the older city of Rome. Here's where we get into some simulation theory, theory evidence. <clears throat> Constantinople was a reflection of the older city of Rome. Rome both began and ended with its first rulers named Romulus. Romulus began. He was the first of seven kings of Rome in 753 BC. Romulus. And Constantinople began and ended with its first ruler's name, Romulus, ending in 476 AD. Constantinople began with Constantine the Great and ended in 1453 with Constantine the 13th, who fought to the death. Rome was founded in 753 BC, or 476 years after the fall of Troy. The year was 1229 BC, which is interesting because Rome fell after 1229 years from its beginning in 753 BC to its end when Romulus was ruling in 476 AD. Interestingly, exactly 476 years after the fall of Constantinople is the year 1929 AD, when Vatican City within Rome became an independent state within Italy. The same year that the Piri Reis map was discovered in the palace of the Sultan of Constantinople, which was originally drawn in 1513 by a, by a Turkish navigator and depicts the shores and hinterlands of South America and Antarctica prior to the two-mile-high ice sheets. That's fascinating. 
For those of you who don't really understand, Rome, Rome began in 753 BC with a man ruling named Romulus, and it lasted 1,229 years till 476 AD when Rome fell with someone on the throne called Romulus. 1,229 years is the Roman history from the monarchy through the Republic all the way to the end of the empire is 1,229 years. But that's interesting because this it fell in 476 AD, but 476 years before Rome was founded in 753 was the year 1229 BC, the fall of Troy, of the Trojan War. You can't make this stuff up. Every bit of this is verifiable in the historical record. I don't have to show you sources on that. Any Google search will tell you those years. All right, moving on. So the War of the Roses between, between the houses of York and, and Lancaster are going on in England. It's like 130 years of war. Uh, let's see. 1456. In the year 1456, Vlad's getting older. He's in Transylvania, but the kingdom that he's being raised in is in Wallachia. However, at this time in history, I think, I think Vlad is a prisoner of the Turks. Early in his lifetime, he learned Arabic. Dracula has a very interesting history. We're going to get to it. But I think at this time in 1456, he's a prisoner among the Muslims. In 1456, Antonio Bonfini and others left records of an unusual comet half as long as the sky that exhibited two tails of a golden color like flames. Very interesting. In 1458, this, my friends, is a book that I have read and studied, and I can even direct you on how to order your own copy. In 1458... At 96 years old, born in 1362, the Jewish mystic named Abraham, son of Simon, wrote a book. The title was The Book of Sacred Magic of Abramel and the Mage, a most fascinating compendium of knowledge on, on control over spirits and demons, a magical treatise allegedly passed down from an old sage in Egypt named Abramelin. After journey, journeying through Germany, Bohemia, Australia, I mean, yeah, I mean Austria, Hungary, France, and Greece to Constantinople, on through the Holy Land and the Arabian Desert, Abraham found a bremelin in Egypt. Who, who was he who had declared unto me the secret and opened un, unto me the fountain and true source, source of the sacred mysteries and of the veritable and ancient magic which God has given unto our forefathers? This is on page 18 of the book of the sacred magic of Abramel and the mage. I have read that book and I'm going to tell you it is deep. I have read magical treatises from the 1400s and 1500s. I have read everything written and recorded today that we have copies of by Henry Cornelius Agrippa. And uh, I'm going to tell you now, A Bremel and the Mage is a very deep book on magic. Uh, it's a different kind of deep. It's not like Francis Barrett, the Magus. So uh, it's a good book if, if that's your thing. And now... I wish I had John John Liska's uh, war drum right here. I'd start beating on the war drum, letting y'all know the story begins. We are now entering the entering Vlad into the historical narrative. One hour and thirty three minutes. I'm sorry, guys. Took took so long to get to Vlad. Hope y'all can forgive me. Let's see. I do agree. I, I don't know what comment I just read. I saw I just saw a piece of a comment and then a, the thread moved moved before I could do it. Somebody made a comment. Don't sell the other channel short. I agree 100%. I agree 100%. The, 
these other channels that I've done podcasts with, everybody brings value to the table. It's just a different piece of value. Uh, a lot of people cannot be faulted for not being able to go into the historical depth. I can, but I have heard, I have heard things out of the mouth of like Campbell of autodidactic after he and I have became vaguely familiar with each other's work. Uh, I agree with 100%. It's a, uh, we bring different things to the table. I did a podcast. I did a podcast with, with Jay dreamers and over his plasma apocalypse. We, we have totally different ideas about what's happening, but a lot of the information comports with each other. Um, and I made a major discovery and even developed a whole new chart that I have shown many times in, in videos, uh, based off something I learned from Jay dreamer. So yeah, don't ever sell these other like mud floods, flat earth, all that. Yeah, these guys bring value to the table, but but it all depends on where you're at. It's as simple as that. Because uh, I've I, I've been I've been listening to John Levy. He and he and I have kissed and made up. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, I'm just teasing. But we've messaged. Uh, I've listened to John Levy. Uh, I've listened to uh, who is that? I never get his name right. I had a. I, I, on my own initiative, I apologize to this guy. I, I used to confuse him with John Levy all the time. The anthropologist guy, I can't remember, I, out of California. Really good videos, really good videos. But I had no idea that he was bucking the establishment so bad. I had no idea. So, you know, uh, I just cast judgment too soon on him, that's all. We're, we're going to get into Vlad right now. Really interesting stuff about Vlad. Okay, so the person you know of the person that, that you know of as Dracula is a Hollywood version of an actual person uh, who basically the establishment hated. So what had happened is that Vlad was the, of the nobility in Wallachia, a kingdom that is now known that, that would that would fit in Romania, Transylvania or Ro Romania today. So early in his life, well, he, his father was, was in the order of the dragon in uh, Societas Draconis. And he was captured by the Turks. The Turks captured and they kept noble noble children to keep rulers in certain European areas in check. It's a very ancient practice. It's nothing the Turks made up. This goes back, back to Babylonian, Akkadian, Egyptian times. So our hero here, Vlad, he was a prisoner. He learned Arabic. He learned, he learned Turkish. He learned all the ways and customs of the Turks. He watched how their administrators uh, ruled. And uh, although he was a captive, he was a noble captive. So he was educated by them. He was fed by them, housed, clothed, all that. But one thing the Turks should have never done was allow Vlad to escape because he did. And when he returned to Wallachia, he returned to rule and he did. And he became very feared. Now, what he did is he basically took these one of the smallest, most insignificant kingdoms in all of Europe and turned it into a propaganda machine that that basically terrified the rest of the known world that heard the stories that were coming out of Wallachia. This is what Vlad did. Now in the perpetuation of any deception, you also have to mix some truth in it. So he wasn't just a dragon and he wasn't, he wasn't drinking blood, even doing all that. But his method of execution horrified people. So in the year 1459, Vlad, Vladimir is already back in Wallachia ruling. He's having trouble on two different fronts. Vlad is for his people, and his people love him. 
But that's not, you don't get a lot of that from the historical record because the historical record was basically forged by the establishment. They never liked Vlad. The Roman Catholic Church couldn't stand him. The papacy couldn't stand him. He sent two cardinals one time uh, uh, to um, to basically force him into into a, to a move because what stood between the Roman Wallachia stood between the papacy and the Turks in this little strip of land. Well. The, the papacy wanted to sacrifice those regions to the Turks so they could have an advantage and be secure. They wanted to play weak, and uh, they didn't want to go up against the Turks, especially after the fall of Constantinople. So, But it couldn't happen because this dude, Vlad, would, would not get out of their way. He wasn't going to sacrifice his little, his little kingdom. He wasn't going to let the Turks come in. The Turks tried. They sent troops in tentative hunter, 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 uh, uh, searcher hunter teams and stuff trying to come in to find Vlad's forces. Vlad fought guerrilla war, uh, warfare, but when, but when different, uh, excursion groups, military groups didn't return, the Turks would send more scouts and say, Hey man, go find out what happened to our people. What happened to my damn army? They go in there and the scouts would come up and they would enter Transylvania, Wallachia. They would go in there and they would come across an open a, 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 a glade and they would see a field. They would hear it and smell it first. Then they would finally come up and they would see Muslims impaled on slowly sliding down stakes where the stake was put up their anus and they were slid all the way down it and it would come out in their guts. Sometimes they were impaled on their sides, underneath the rib cage, and slowly the, the the stake would go up their body and pop out their neck, their their collarbone, or co come out through the side of the neck. It was a very slow death. Gravity killed them. Just body slowly sliding down, splintered wood. Screams and moaning could be heard for a long distance. When the Muslim scouts would go into these fields and see this, it brought such terror to them. They would flee back. They would go tell their overseers what they saw, and they were disbelieved time and time again. Muslim armies would go in there, and the Wallachians under Vlad would, would, would surround them, fight guerrilla-style warfare, chase them off with war drums, making them believe there was more, more people defending the force than there were. And every time that the Muslims left, the Turks left, the rear guard, the slower ones were captured, impaled on stakes, and left in a new meadow. Vlad did this over and over and over, and finally the Turks left him alone. Now, the Roman papacy didn't. 1459. Third, check this out. 1459. The Jews are being bounced around from nation to nation. Now, you're going to be told in the, in the encyclopedias and the historial books, you got to understand who owns all these now. You're going to be told that they were the victims. You're going to be told all this. But every single nation in Europe and on multiple occasions throughout the last 15 centuries have kicked these people out of their country. And it's always for the exact same reason, financial malpractice. So the papacy sent 30,000 of them in, into Transylvania. Vlad had his men stop them at Brasov. When he realized what the Pope was really trying to do and that the 30,000 merchants were trying to force their hand, the, the, the uh, Wallachians' hand and they weren't going to leave, that they, re that, that they really thought Vlad was going to let them come into his domain and set up shop and do all the things that they were doing in all these European countries for which they were getting kicked out of, Vlad went down in history and he impaled all 30,000 of these people. The shockwaves throughout Europe, the Turkish Empire, and the Vatican were profound. This single incident in 1459 earned him the nickname Vlad the Impaler. Remember, this is the history of Dracula.
an interesting aside, right here in Chronicon, under 1459, under the book, The Dragon Legacy, page 16, the House of Dracul, which was Vlad's, Vlad's name, his name was Vlad Dracul, the House of Dracul traced their ancestry back to Attila the Hun and the sons of Genghis Khan. That's pretty interesting. So one year later, you got to understand, other things are happening at this time. But one year later, one year later, near the mountains of Bern, Switzerland, miners were digging for metals at a depth of 100 feet when they suddenly came across a cavern that had an entirely, an entirely preserved wooden ship inside a mountain. It was well fashioned with ornamentation. Its masts were broken and an anchor was found. But to the horror of the miners, they also discovered among the timbers of this strange vessel 40 human skeletons of men that never got out the ship. Uh, I have a note here in Chronicon because that that reference to a ship found in Switzerland uh, 100 feet deep into a mountain in a cavern is from a book called The Secret Cities of Old South America by Harold T. Wilkins. It was written over 100 years ago. The, the, I have an annotation here that says, For other impossible discoveries of ships found inside a mountain, See the years 1503 and 1540. So right here, let's make this a little bit interactive. We got some time. Tell me in the chat section if you want me to read those two other sections real quick where ships have been found underground. If I see it in the chat, I'll, I'll do it. Let me see real quick. Meanwhile, 1460 is also the year that Leonardo of Pistoia found the famous Corpus Hermeticum. Oh my God. Okay, no more, no more, no more. <laughs> oh my God, no boy. God, at least 30 of y'all at the same time. Okay, let's read it then. Let's read it. 1460, Corpus Hermeticum is found. This is the principal core foundational text uh, of the Hermetic literature. In, that te in those texts, and there, for, the, for those of you who don't know, the Hermetic literature basically refers to the Greek version of Enoch. But you all didn't know that, did you? Now, the Hermeticum refers to those before the flood as, quote, leaving great memorials of their works on the earth, unquote. Many believe this is a reference to the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid Complex, complex Karnak, Newgrange, and Stonehenge. Wow. Okay, so the, the annotation in Chronicon under 1460 AD reads, if you want to know more about ships found underground, look at 1503 and 1540. So let's go look, 1503 and 1540. Let's do it. 1503 and 1540. This is how Chronicon works, guys. I've been trying to tell y'all. Chronicon takes you back and forth throughout history. It shows you all the patterns. It, show, it doesn't show you all of them. I show new ones all the time in my videos. But it shows you a lot. You would you would spend over a year researching Chronicon's 510 pages. And the supplemental notes. I got 700 pages of supplemental notes. So the research will never end. But 1503. Chronicon's in Gumroad for those of you who want to want to look at it. And you'll be surprised. I, I make it super cheap. Three dollars for this one. Five dollars for that one. All it's Gumroad. I make things real cheap. Fifteen oh three. It's been a long time since I read this. The year fifteen oh three was fifty three ninety seven Annus Mundi. It is exactly thirty seven. It is exactly three thousand seven hundred forty one years after the Great Flood. In this year of fifteen oh three. Mikhail del Nostradam, or Nostradamus, is born to Jewish parents who had converted to Catholicism in France, fearing the Inquisition. I better mark this. He is destined to be the most popular prophet ever, and for good reason. In this year, a windstorm dislodged a huge chunk of rock from the high mountain overlooking the sea at Naples, Italy, 
Inside the rock was found the amazing fossil of a primordial ship, and the spectators took note that the vessel was like nothing of the ships of their time. An Italian historian and statesman trusted by the public named Giovanni Potano was one of the many who witnessed and studied this amazing find. For other buried ships from antiquity, see 1460 and 1540. All right, we already been to we already been to 1460. I'm just reading these, even though I'm familiar with them, because I'm trying to show you the value of Chronicon, where you where if if something very unique is mentioned, it's also referenced in other years. It took me a long time to put this together. All right, 1540. Let's go to 1540. Here we are, 1540. In 1540. The Jews are expelled from Italy. Also, in Italy, the Pope Paul III formally authorizes the existence of the Jesuits. Peter Appian, in his Astron Astronomicon Caesarium, published in this year, remarked that comet tails always point away from the sun. I don't know if that's true or not. That was published in 1540. Spanish miners searching for silver and gold traces near Calel, Peru, removed earth in a deep mine shaft, and they were surprised to discover an entombed wooden ship of extreme antiquity unlike anything they were familiar with. For other unusual ships, see the year, <laughs> see the years fifteen oh three and fourteen sixty. All right. Okay. Now I also have those are just underground ships that were found inside mountains or underground. I also have in Chronicon several references to ships where there are no bodies of water. Okay. Now. We entertain. You guys know I'm I'm famous for my tangents. You guys know I'm do those tangents. So, all right, let's go back to 1460. Fourteen sixty one. Just a friendly reminder, guys. One over one thousand people listening. Eight hundred and seventy likes. I sure hope there's not 270 of y'all that don't like it. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Mohammed II, called the Conqueror, set out to kill Vlad Dracul. He was going to open the way of Wakawa, Wallachia so the Turks could better invade inside the interior of, of Europe. Because once Transylvania, Wallachia, Wallachia was gone, and for those of you who need to know, geographically, we're talking about Romania. Once it was out of the way, and once they could get carved their way through the forest, Europe was wide open to the Turks. So, by this time, by this time, Dracula, as he was being called at the time, is also called the Impaler. He was feared and despised for his atrocities in Europe, but he was admired for his war exploits against the Turks. In his own kingdom of Wallachia in Transylvania, he removed all threats to the security of the realm. He refused to allow Jews into his administration. As a youth, he was a prisoner of the Turks and had spent several years growing up among them, seeing how the Turks employed Jewish scribes and, and uh, financial officers in their administration. Vlad was aware that these people had aided the Turks against Constantinople and acted as spies all throughout Europe for the Turks against the Christian Europeans. In this year, the Turks invaded Wallachia and Vlad led his men in a series of raids against the immense Turkish army train, kidnapping Turks and bringing them back to his castle called Tigor, Tigor Vist. In the dark of night, when the Turks under Mohammed arrived to Turgo Vist, they, they were met with a ghastly sight. A clearing in the woods in front of the castle had 20,000 people impaled on poles in the air. 
Many of them were already decomposing and others were still alive, moaning and whimpering in pain. The Muslim Turks recognized instantly that many of the victims were from their own army of the night before. Dracula escaped and the Turks fled the country. That's crazy. Dracula and his men went one word and the Turks just didn't even chase. They just left. That's crazy. That was in 1461. In 1462, we have... Well, that's about Trimethius. You got, I, we're not going to get into Johannes yet. Johannes Trimethius the chronologist and mystic who is the true force behind Nostradamus. He's a, he's a subject matter for another time. 1469. Niccolo Machiavelli is born, author of The Prince, The Art of War. And for those of you who don't know, I've read this book. I've read the book and it's very good. But Machiavelli didn't just write The Prince, and he didn't just write The Art of War. I have read The Discourses, and they're pretty good. They're also by Niccolo Machiavelli. All right. Keep seeing those flashes on my screen. Oh, we got people from the Caribbean in here. Lord Matthew, prerogative private tax assessor. How you doing, bud? I think I answered your last email. Trismithius. Matthew, it's Trismithius. Send me an email. I'll send you the whole name and date. All right. So, 1476. In 1476, we have something very interesting. We always have something very interesting. I just love to say that. Vlad the Impaler is assassinated by the Turks. His head is taken to Constantinople, which is now called Istanbul. His head is put on a stake. Constantinople, remember... Remember the 476 year year uh, motif that's connected to Constantinople, the fall of Troy, fall of Constantinople, fall of Rome. 476 each time. Well, get this. This is the year 1476 AD, which just so happens to be exactly 1,000 years after the fall of Rome. Vlad the Impaler is assassinated. But we're not done with Vlad. We're not done with Vlad at all. Because for those of you who have pen and paper out, I'm going to show you something really interesting. 1476. 1476. Now we're going to get into calendrics now. I'm going to show you what what this all what how we build a picture. How we build a picture for what is soon to transpire. Because I was asked recently to do some predictions for Romania. I've already done them in the past. I'm, I'm, I need, I'm about to do them again, probably starting tonight. I'm a little behind on, on all my stuff. But we have some interesting developments in Romania in 2028. And they're connected to the history that I just now told you about. So let's get into it. Vlad, well, Vlad was assassinated and killed in 1476. But something happened after that, after his history, that basically molded the public mind into merging the concepts of his life with a woman's life Later on, have any of you heard of Elizabeth Bathory, the blood duchess? She was accused, well, she was of noble blood, and of course, she's a duchess, but she was accused of killing over 100 young girls, slowly bleeding them out, 
to bathe in their blood. Elizabeth Bathory murdered over a hundred girls because she thought it would make her skin look better to bathe in their blood. Many people have the, this, this real history, this super real history about Elizabeth Bathory has elements that have throughout time somehow been, been transferred to Dracula drinking blood. It's very interesting. But what's even more profound is Vlad died in 1476 AD. 138 years later, Elizabeth Bathory was executed for all for drinking for you know all the blood 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 stuff she did with those young girls. Let's look up. Let's look up 1614 real quick. Those of you new to my channel, you're not going to know anything I'm talking about about the 138 year year cycle. You're not. You just got to bear with us because there's a whole lot of people in this thread know exactly what I'm talking about. 1614. First thing I have here for uh, 1614 is historian William Brambley wrote that in this year, the German order of the Rosicrucians at Hess announced their presence in a dramatic publication and that the policy of the order was to be publicly active and visible for 108 years before going underground again for another 108 years. This is intriguing for the Masonic Utopian Empire, the United States of America ends in cataclysm in 2046. Exactly 432 years or 108 times three years from this exact date. That is very interesting. So the Rosicrucians had already had a timekeeping system in 1614. Every 108 years, they're either proselytizing and they're publishing things, and then for 108 years, the Rosicrucians go underground. They're a secret society. Nobody knows anything about them. But on this 108-year cycle, it ends in 2046. Many of you know the significance of 2046. I don't have to tell you anything. But in 1614, Elizabeth Bathory is executed for, for her sins, well, basically, or basically criminal trespasses. Uh, the, the other nobles couldn't hide it anymore. But this is 138 years after the death of Vlad. Two people with basically similar histories, but two people who are world famous. So, or 138 years apart. Now, 138 years after her death, in this same holography, we have that 1752, what I did the last video on. 1752, the octagonal star. But not only that, other people since then have sent me material, and I, and I released a post showing that it was a lot of stuff that happened in uh, 1752. Also, some calendar riots. But I can I can thank a, I can thank a subscriber for sending me references to the calendar riots of 1752. But the strange octagonal star. But it doesn't really have anything to do with Vlad. It only has it only has uh, it's only interesting because it's 138 years after she died, 276 after he died, which is 138 and 138. But I'm not done with the structuring. That's 138 years before 1890. A reset period that I have discussed a few times and that I'm going to do a live podcast with, with Gary Warmerdam. We're going to discuss why 1890 was so critical, 12 years before 1902, when the elite came out of hiding and unleashed their new infrastructure, unleashed hundreds of new companies the world had never heard of before in 1902. i got five videos on 1902 now. So 1890 is a year I've shown the chronometry of is very unusual. It has something to do with that reset. Maybe that's the year they went in hiding. I don't know. Gary Warmerdam and I, we're going to get to the bottom of it. 138 years after that is 2028, which is coming up pretty fast. Six more years, five and a half more years. But before we do, we go, we do that, let's go back to 1476. And if this 138-year cycle has merit... 
than what was before that. 138 years before 1476 was 1338. What happened in that year? Why would that be relative to this to this chronographical thread? Let's see 1338. In 1338, German princes met at Rents and formally revoked the right of the Pope to choose a German ruler. This was exactly the 800th year from the rise of the papacy, which, it, which, which has its own year one as 538 AD. 800th year. Interesting. Eight is the number of new beginnings. 800. Now, so 138 years, 138 years before before Vlad died, who had stringently opposed the Pope. Oh, I didn't even tell you that antidote. I didn't even tell you about that. The Pope was so pissed off about Vlad uh, not responding to all his deals. He sent uh, because he sent the, the the papacy had sent a few messengers, and Vlad uh, impaled them. He wasn't even going to send a message back to the Pope. He impaled the messengers. So Vlad gets uh, two new messengers with an entourage, and it's two cardinals. Do you have any idea how unusual it is for the for cardinals to leave Rome? Two cardinals went to Wallachia. There were one of them was pretty demanding. The other one was more laid back. So before they even got to to, to make a request or anything, the one that Vlad wasn't feeling, the asshole cardinal, the one who thought he was more important than himself, he was removed forcibly from the table by, by, by Wallachian soldiers. As the other cardinal was invited to dine with Vlad, they sat across the table from each other and they had, a, they had a silent meal. And as they're eating, the cardinal that wasn't taken was listening to the screams of the cardinal that was being run down, run down a stake. He was being impaled and then elevated into the air and set into a post. As he's listening to his, his fellow cardinal screaming, they finish their meal. And Vlad basically tell, tell, tells him, I says, I guess you, I, I guess uh, you have everything you need for 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 the, for the papal whatever, and the cardinal said he said yeah indeed I do. They didn't call talk communicate exchange mess nothing. It was understood that Vlad was not doing no talking, and that cardinal made it out with his life. Other times the pope the papacy had tried to send uh the, not not messengers but different types of people who were going to integrate into Wallachia financially. And uh, Vlad had told people over and over, do not come into my kingdom. And they still wouldn't listen. They still came in. So at one time, he had a giant cauldron with eight windows made. He was creative. And he was, he was brutal, too. And I saw in the comments that somebody was mentioning that Vlad was the way he was because he was tortured, and he probably was. I don't remember reading that. But then again, I've only I've only read like three different books on the life of Vlad Dracul. There's there's more, many more than that. He probably was tortured by the by the Turks. So, uh, or he maybe he witnessed torture witnessed torture by the Turks. But he had a cauldron set up with eight windows. And eight eight men who were coming, I believe they were Jewish, who came into his country trying to force their way in financially to do business with, with Transylvanians, he put them in that cauldron strapped to uh, the deal. So their faces were pointing out the windows and he assembled a feast and had all, all his people come and he lit the pyre and he basically boiled them alive. Because it was full of water under and with a fire going, and that cast iron got hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, and all the people could see their faces in the little iron windows as they were screaming. So that's all. Vlad was brutal. I'm not giving him any. I'm not giving him any. Uh, uh, I'm not patting him on the back. I'm not doing. A, I'm just stating matter of factly. He was against the establishment. 
He went up against Rome. He went up against the Turks. He went up against the other European nations. He went up against the Jews. He went up against everybody. And in the end, he was assassinated, but that was after he led his people for a very long time, and they loved him for it. History paints him as Dracula, but they mixed in they mixed in information uh, some of the information from Elizabeth Bathory's story, The Blood Duchess. Their deaths are 138 years apart. Now, it's all very interesting. So 138 and 138 is 276. So, uh, and you guys know the cursed earth system that I, that I revealed in some of my videos is 414 years. It was discovered by Stephen Jones, a biblical chronologist. He had no idea that the Phoenix, the Phoenix period was 138 years. He didn't know that. But he published a book called The Secrets of Time based off the fact that many, many events in history that were related to each other are all found on 414-year timelines. Not just a single 414 years isolated, but a whole timeline. Well, I found and I found what he's talking about many times. Here's one right here. Vlad Vlad Dracula was assassinated in 1476 by the Turks, but that was 414 years, which is 138 times 3 after 1062. So let's look up 1062 real quick to see what its relevance is. This is how you use Chronicon. Besides, a lot of the notes I'm telling you are in Chronicon. You just follow, follow the notes. 1062, the Turks invaded Greece and destroyed many with bloodshed, almost all of Greek Christendom, as well as northeastern Italy, enslaved or murdered. It's terrible. Yep. That's, that, that, yeah, there's no doubt. That's 100% relative. So, just as in, now this is 1062, just just as had occurred 350 to 352 years earlier when the Muslim Saracens and Moors invaded Southern Europe through Spain, the local Jews living among the Christians aided the Turks in taking the towns and enslaving the population. Just as the Islamic administration raised many Jews to prominence for their treachery against their Christian hosts, so too did the Turks elevate the Jews in their administration over the Christians. History repeats itself. The only dumbasses here are, are Christian Europeans. Simple as that. This is why history is kept from us over and over and over and over and over. Because the same, the same exact play is moved by the same people over and over. So anyway, every one of these events are, are, are all divisible by 138. They're all. So when you're doing any type of predictive analytics and you find pattern like that is so cohesive, you take elements from each historical holographic set of variables and you apply them to, to the whole. The whole here is all of this is leading up to 2028. It's very interesting. All this is leading up to 2028. So I would like to 2020, 20, 2028 is six, what is 2022? Five and a half years from now. Five and a half years from now is not a long period of time at all. So we are. So in 2028, in order to understand basically what's going to happen in 2028, we put all this together. We have we have we have the element of Muslims, we have the element of Jews, we have the element here of Romania. It doesn't matter if it was called Wallachia, Transylvania back then at all. We have a very, very uh we have a leader that is loved by the people, but he's feared by outsiders distinction 2028 we have we have a very dynamic personality he's going to be assassinated in 2028 he's going to be loved by people but hated by jews he's going to be hated by the papacy he's going to be hated by muslims but he's going to be loved by christian europeans in 2028 he's going to be taken out and it's going to start a whole chain of deals 
uh, of circum uh, all kinds of deals. We take all these elements. We're going to have something astronomically unusual, something appearing in the sky in 2028. Attached to 1752, uh, attached to 1890, these are attached to 1338. These are, we take these holographic pieces of the past that are in the same mathematical framework and they, and they construct and build for you a picture in the future. So when we arrive to 2028 and I see assassination and all that, can I verify it isometrically? Yes, I can. Because 2028, let me do the, let me do the math. 2028, I know square pegs, listen, square peg is on her computer like this right now. I promise you she is. I promise where she is. This type of stuff she wants to hear. 2028. Minus 1998, the key epicentral year to decode anything that's going to happen in the last days. After 1890 and before 2106, 1998, 666 times 3 is the year to measure as your epicenter. Everything ripples off from that. 30 years is the difference. 2028 is 30 years from 1998. But, 19, but 30 years before 1998 is 1968. 1968. You guys see that? It's 1968. Yeah. Hold on just a second. 1968. On April 4th, civil rights black leader Martin Luther King is assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, triggering racial riots in many U.S. City, ci ci uh, cities. On June 5th, Robert Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles after winning the California primary election. In Russia, Yuri Gagarin, the first Russian cosmonaut in space, died in a plane crash. I have evidence. Now, this is the official version. I have evidence otherwise. Yuri Gagarin was murdered. Now, Oh, I'm not done. I'm not done. So, three assassinations in 1968, isometrically linked to the year 2028. Now, and these are not, and these are on the 138-year Phoenix timeline, going all the way back to 1062, the establishment of the Turks. Basically, he shows us that the assassination that's going to make world news and affect many things in the world is going to happen in Romania. It's going to be a very popular individual with the people. This person's going to die. They're going to be killed in 2028, isometrically. It's, it, it's all linked to it. Now, what else happened in 1968 that may be relative to this Phoenix timeline? In Iraq, Babylon, the CIA secretly supported and aided the Ba'ath Party, installing Saddam Hussein as a dictator. Is that what the assassination is about? Are the alphabets going to install their own man? Because it wasn't the only thing they were doing. Because in 1968, the CIA initiated Project Phoenix. Don't don't think I'm making that up. They initiated Project Phoenix. Project Phoenix was about torturing people for information. You can't make this stuff up, my friends. Can't make that stuff up at all. David Icke, if you're listening to me, you already know where that information comes from, my brother. So, I'll put, this, I'll put Chronicon up. This was a very simple exercise. This was a very simple exercise. We just looked at the century of the 1400s. Many of the Tartarian anomalies can come from this period and before. Because remember, when we were leaving the Dark Ages, we were, we were about to start gaining an ascendancy when the beginning of the Middle Ages, I mean, when, when the Middle Ages first started, we were about to take off. Remember, I tell you guys all the time, it only takes 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider. But the Middle Ages took off. 
we're about to do all kinds of incredible things. And then suddenly, Nemesis X object in 1314 appears as a great black darkness. Nothing but chaos till 1346. By 1347, one third of the entire world's population was dead. And it wasn't from rats from Asia. So, Vlad Dracul, Vlad Dracul, a hero, a hero of the people, wasn't necessarily a good man. He was a product of his times. So I'm not I'm not going to turn him into a saint, but I'm not going to demonize him either. I understand the the pressures he was up against. The whole world was against his little strip of a kingdom, and he prevailed. Assassination is how he went out. The Blood Duchess was killed as well. Kennedy was killed on the same timeline. Martin Luther King killed on the same timeline. One of the greatest heroes of the Russian people, Yuri Gagarin, was killed on the same timeline. CIA initiate black ops projects, op Operation Phoenix. We are looking at a holographic construct so we can use and study history, whether it happened or not. I tell you guys, a lot of these things I studied history may have never happened, but the fact that they've been introduced in the historical record and there are old books that cite them means that they're there for our instruction. They're there for us to learn from. And, in lear and what I learn is that we're living in a mathematical construct and that construct obeys fixed protocols and laws. And when you learn to isolate those particulars, you can build pictures of the future. You just have to obey the arithmetic. You can't contort it. Isometric projections are used all the time by me to verify if historical events actually happened or not, or if they're meant for us to find and not invented by somebody who's trying to throw me off, like an old author or somebody who is agenda-driven. Two hours and 20 minutes, and I don't feel like shutting my mouth yet. My presentation on Vlad and the Blood Duchess Elizabeth Bathory is over. Both of them died 138 years apart. That doesn't mean this video has to end. Let me go through this thread. Ah. You know what? I don't even think it's going to let me go all the way to the top of the thread. It won't. After a while, it just, yeah, I can only go so far. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. There's the section where everybody said yes, yes to the ships. <laughs> hey, I think I thank you, moderators, doing a great job. You know me. I, I after the end of the video, I'll spend an hour going through the whole chat thread. Star Child, thank you. Oh, I see some questions. Sure do. Go check, go check on your dogs. <laughs> Stop it. Let's see. Thought I saw a question. I oh uh, inverted illusion. I would be very, it would be very suspect. I don't know what you're calling. You're, you're calling it the gospel of the Lord. Uh, and then you're saying, AKA Markian's gospel, 144 AD. Listen, I don't know what publisher put, put uh, Markian's gospel together. And uh, I, I, it's highly suspect because I'm telling you now, over 120 years ago, several scholars reconstructed uh, Markian's gospel Based, based off 10,000 hours of research, multiple, because uh, uh, there has never been found a text called the Gospel of the Lord by Marcion, ever. We have many fragments that can be put together from a multitude of sources to show that what, what Marcion's gospel was, but the actual gospel of Marcion was constructed by scholars over a hundred years ago. And you can read about it in a book published about 130 years ago uh, called uh, uh, Charles Waite. His name is Charles Waite. The first 200 years or uh, the first, the first 200 years of the Christian religion. Yeah, that's a, uh, 
if there's another, if there's like a Christian publisher uh, that's now out trying to call something the gospel of the Lord, you have to understand there were four different forgeries of the book of Jasher as well. This is what turned scholars off. Somebody in Bristol, England published a book of Jasher, and that's the one that was submitted to the Royal Society, and they were very turned off by it. But it wasn't the book of Jasher we have today. Uh, yeah, it's uh, similar things have happened with the book of Enoch. Different publishers come out and they'll call it something, man, to get those those sales, but it's not the original. It's not it at all. Marcion did not know of any miracles by Jesus. There was no virgin birth, no garden of Gethsemane. There was no sun darkening. Uh, the crucifixion, it might have been a crucifixion, but there was absolutely no sun darkening and earthquake when, when, uh, when uh, Jesus died. And so the gospel of Marcion was, some, was basically about a man who was, spoken divine parables and awesome teachings, but it was completely devoid of the miraculous. See. Prince Charles is related to Vlad the Impaler. Well, that means Prince Charles would be related to Genghis Khan as well and the Huns. I don't know. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, all caps. What does it mean when the elite have one black eye? I don't know. I don't follow social media. I don't follow nothing modern. I'm sorry. I don't know. Prince Charles related to Vlad. I don't know. I have notes on a Braxis, but it's not. I, I remember some references in like Agrippa. But I, it's not nothing I've really researched. I haven't found anything substantive. Prince bought Vlad's castle and stays there. Hey, four jacks. We don't need that. We don't need that that word in the chat. Uh, please take that comment down. The adrenal, the adrenal C. I don't need that type of. Attention, I don't need the, the YouTube algorithm focusing on my chat, man. Thank you, Vlasta. That's a unique name, Vlasta. Thank you. Have you ever heard of the Cave of Treasures from the Book of Adam? Yes, I have. I've read the Book of Adam. I've read the Book of Adam and Eve. As a matter of fact, it's two books in the Pseudopigraphia. It's a... Uh, the book of Adam and Eve 1 and 2. I even cite them in some of my videos where, where Lucifer and Satan are just going off explaining why they did what they did. It's pretty interesting. Four Jacks, thank you. <laughs> my bad, brother. I'm looking for some questions. Mish Gleason, there was nuclear testing in 1968, which is the isometric, uh, it's the isometric uh, uh, parallel to uh, 2028. But I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to call CME for that yet. For that, there is more evidence that that a a reduplication of the 1859 Carrington event may play out in 2023 next year as, as a as a uh, basically a staged event. I don't believe a real solar flare has any threat to it. It's not going to happen. I believe it's going to be staged. Robert Seifer, that's right. That's the guy. That's the guy's name I couldn't remember, man. He and I have exchanged messages. He's really a great guy. He's got some good stuff. Uh, the reason I was, the reason I listened for about half a day to a bunch of Robert Seifer's deal is because somebody put out a video trying to clown Robert Seifer. This 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 historian scholar guy put it out. So I listened to it, and I it really, I, I really got got pissed as I'm listening to it. I'm like, man, I can't believe that this dude's attacking this guy like that, it, because the attack 
that was done on Robert Seifer was so mediocre, if you actually know your historical material. It was so abbreviated and just, it was full of, of anecdotes that really didn't have anything to do with Seifer's message. Uh, and it was full of a bunch of personal attacks rather than what Seifer was talking about. And when he did try to cite history, he, he misquoted things. And I was so pissed by this dude's analysis, I had never even listened to Robert Seifer. So when I listened to this, I went and listened to about five Robert Seaver videos. I'm like, holy shit. So I went back through my through my uh my my emails and I put Robert Seifer in my in my emails because it pulls up everybody who's mentioned him in my emails. And I'm looking at all these old emails where people were telling me about Robert Seifer that I, I may be wrong about him, that he's that he's got some pretty good videos. Well, I listened to one about uh oh uh, <clears throat> ancient Sumer, and uh, you guys already know that. One of my principal tenets is showing all the historical data that the whole Anunnaki Anuna narrative is a Caucasian invasion into a non-Caucasian world. And I show all this and I was well, I basically saw the same thing in one of his videos, but presented in a totally different way. So uh, I saw all the statues of, of the blue of the blue-eyed Sumerians, of uh, the big goggle eyes and all that. And I've explained to you guys in my videos that that's where the term watcher had come from. The uh, non-Caucasians were recording the first appearance of white people, and just like white people uh, over-exaggerate the, the Oriental eyes, and we make them look like this, the same thing Orientals do to us. Our eyes aren't don't look like golf balls, but that's what they do. They over, they over-accentuate them. So... Yeah, I I, looked, I I sent Robert Seifer a message, told him, man, I really apologize. I misjudged you. I had no idea that you were a thorn into the side of academia. I didn't know that you went against the grain. I had assumed that because he's an anthropologist, he's one of the enemy. Simple as that. If you know, are human sacrifices towards the Phoenix worship? Okay. Uh, T. Witten, 828. T. Witten, 828. Wow, 828. 414 times 2. 828 is a Phoenix number, my brother. It's 138 times 6. So, uh, question. If you know our human sacrifices towards Phoenix, I'm going to tell you a very interesting, interesting story about human sacrifice. In 1687 BC, and I'm not going to sit here and try to reprove, try to prove it. I've got so much data on this one year. Hell, one guy wrote an entire 500-page book just showing that the entire old world died in 1687 BC. So, in 1687 BC, on the Isle of Crete, in the ruins of Knossos' is a temple. When archaeologists were excavating that temple, they found a young man still, st the skeleton of a young man, still strapped to a sacrificial table. They were about to sacrifice him when they died, and the temple had collapsed on itself and killed everybody. This was 1687 B.C. This is the background to the story of Clash of the Titans. This is when Perseus fought, used the head of Medusa to turn to stone the Kraken. It is why in the movie, the, when, the, when, when the city of Joppa is destroyed by flood, which is interesting, this is supposed to be an ancient Greek city, but it's showing the beginning of a Canaanite city being flooded when the sun darkens. This is 1687 BC Phoenix Phoenix phenomenon. Perseus is the destroyer. He's rescuing Andromeda. Andromeda is chained to a rock. The Medusa motif derived from the fact that human sacrifice in the old Bronze Age was uh, among the Mediterranean cultures of Argos and Joppa was very, very similar. You see, people were drugged and they were laid out on stone sacrificial tables before to, to avert earthquakes and natural disasters. And a giant squid about the size of a man's head with tentacles about two feet long was taken out of the water and put over the face of the victim. The squid would then eat the face off the still drugged up living victim uh, of the sacrifice. It was gruesome, it was horrific, but 
This method of execution was famous back then. It is the origin of the story, Medusa, of a woman having the, the locks of snakes coming off her head. It's actually from when women were laid, laid on tables and giant squids were basically suffocated them while they're eating their face off because the squid's beak is underneath all the tentacles laid on top of the woman's face. It is, it's, it's terrible. Terrible way to die. I don't know if they felt pain or not. They were drugged because nobody would willingly just lay there and take that. But uh, uh, they were drugged. That was just, that was that was during Phoenix episodes. Uh, those who were fearing it back then in those cultures and they were terrified. That's what they did. They uh, they um, they sacrificed people to to avert that. That's what the story of Andromeda is about. The, uh, the people of Argos were trying to not die like the people of Joppa uh, uh, of Canaan did. So uh, there's a lot of other themes in the Clash of the Titans that I should, you know what? I don't do movie breakdowns and all that, but I should do a breakdown of the Clash of the Titans to show you that the entire thing is about a Phoenix phenomenon. But yeah, but the movie's just based off all the historical record and I'm not talking about modern day versions. I, I have a mythology. I have an encyclopedia of mythology right here. I can look up Medusa, uh, Perseus, Cla the the uh, uh, all I, the Medusa. I can look all that up, and I'm going to get a real sanitized version. But where you're not going to get a sanitized version, which when you look up 100 year old Greek books like Robert Graves, The White Goddess or the Greek Myths, or if you go into the treasures of Gerald Massey. When you read these old books, that's where you get these massive historical details that are that bring life to these ancient legends and traditions that you guys hear me talking about a lot. So that's uh that that's what you got from me on, on the sacrifice deal. That's the origin of Medusa. They put giant squids on women's faces. Bud Green. I would not be surprised about any new technologies after 1902, Bud Green. I don't know if you're familiar with my work, but I've got five videos out on 1902 and how the elite came out from under hiding in 1902 and released all their new stuff, and that would also mean technology. So any new companies or new inventions from 1902, 1903, 1904, all the way up to about 1915 are not going to be surprising to me because I know where they're coming from. They weren't invented then. They came from underground repositories. see stoic hand grenade wow i don't think there there is by no species of imagination can i even in, invent a scenario where a hand grenade could be described as stoic Yeah, I like Robert Seaver G Shell. That's a new development for me. 1968, Club of Rome. Oh, yeah. Hey, Jason, is it possible to get a physical copy of all your books? Listen, I've got paperback books all, all over uh, Amazon. I do. I don't know where they are. I've got them here somewhere. That's a damn shame. I'm a published author, and I don't even keep up with my own books. I don't have a clue where they are. I got like nine books in here somewhere. Wow. You know what? Oh, I showed them in my last live video, I believe. You can go to you can go to my website to the link called Treasury. And in Treasury, you'll find all the all the types of books and PDFs and thumb drives, things things I have available. Uh, Dreamer of Sirius, this is it. Mm. This is it right here. 1893. This is the Bible. But Bibles back then aren't like, like today. That's, uh, they got, I mean, not a lot's changed, but here's the whole Bible right here. Mm. See, it's hard. Man, this book is so heavy. Hold on. Spent years toting flagstones. I'm talking about a book being heavy. 
It's crazy. Yeah, see all this? Where's... I'm looking for the book of Revelation. Okay, there it is. Book of Revelation. Okay, so this part that's vertical, that's the actual Bible. Very small print. The rest of this book, all this, this is all Cruden's Concordance, one of the best Bible concordances and dictionaries you'll ever find. They way better than Smith's Bible Dictionary or ones I've seen today. You know, Strong's Concordance. This is fantastic. But this is a huge encyclopedia of the Bible, a dictionary and concordance and lexicons. It's a huge, huge. It's falling apart. I gotta be careful with it. I gotta be real careful with it. Man. I gotta be real careful with it. All right. I don't know about the, uh, who just asked me about, El, was that El, El Castillo Pyramid? I was going through the thread so so fast. Somebody asked me about a pyramid in, in Mexico. Let me tell you about Mexico, all right? You are told by the establishment archaeologists today that the oldest places in Mexico are Tenochtitlan and, and Teotihuacan, and it's not true. It's not true at all. Mexico City, there are older places in Mexico today that the government has quarantined that you, you don't have access today. In the early 1900s, William Niven, an archaeologist, was excavating 30 to 60 feet deep in Mexico in, in a valley uh, near Acambaro. He found cities. He found megafauna. He found pyramids and pavements and uh, a, a very sophisticated infrastructure. He found so much stuff, and when he tried to reveal it to the American public, academia went to war against William Niven. Yeah, these are older. Uh, these would be the predecessor civilizations to the Aztecs the to and the Toltecs. It's way before them. Uh, we're talking about pyramid-building civilizations during the age of megafauna. And I've already discussed this in many of my other videos. The megafauna were not in the Ice Age. That's bullshit. Total bullshit. The megafauna, megafauna have been found in the Ohio, Mississippi mound build, builder civilization graves and, and uh, tumuli. Uh, yeah, the megafauna were very recent in history. Megafauna are the giant mammals, the mastodons and mammoths, the giant tree sloths, huge uh, eight, uh, I mean, uh, 1,800 pound pigs. Yeah, man, it's megafauna were gigantic, huge. But I go, but I go in my mini deals with that. Yes. I should do some material on the crystal skull. I can only I can only bring to the table what what David Hatcher Childress already did. If you guys don't know, a lot of my sources are are uh, from the hundreds of very old books that are cited by David Hatcher Childress in his seven book series called the Lost City series. It's fantastic. Highly recommend it. Archaic's stamp of, a true, of approval on David Hatcher Childress's series of books, the Lost Cities. Now, I do not give them a stamp of approval for participating in the ancient aliens BS. I'm not trying to hear that. Yeah, that's crazy. So, not one, not one to carry things further than I, I have a intuitive feel that they should go. So many, some of my videos are well over three hours. I'm not feeling this one needs to be one. It's already two hours and 42 minutes. I'm not seeing hardly any questions um, that are relevant to what we were talking about. I've already made my announcements, the type of help I need. I'll probably be answering emails the rest of the day. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. Just remember, when you're studying history and you find a mathematical pattern that attaches to a multiplicity of events that are all relative in nature, they, they have predictive value. But when you get to the target date by which you want to construct all the holographic pieces into a prediction, you need to verify it with an isometric projection like I did for you today. In Romania, 
a world leader who is well loved by people but hated by other branches of government will be assassinated in Romania in 2028. Alphabet agencies will be involved. All right. With that, peace out, and I love you guys. Oh, and I also love the individual who sent me the two cases of pomegranate grape Mountain Dew. When I showed that Mountain Dew in that video, somebody had sent me two cases of that. I got a case in my refrigerator right now, and I'm about to go drink one. All right, guys. All right, how do I exit this thing? There it is.